Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to our four-part series on researching your genealogy, celebrating Black History Month. My name is Phyllis Bridges. I am the CEO of Hype of Yalik's African American Art and Culture Movement. Uh, I will be, be your virtual host for today. This program is being presented to you by the High Point Museum, the High Point Library, and Yalik's African American Art and Culture Movement. This program will explore various ways to research genealogy and give our guests tools to continue their journey beyond this series. Um, you will also hear amazing stories from the past. At the end of this presentation, we will open it up for Q&A. So if you would like to uh, uh, ask a question, just go to our chat room and put it in and we share answer at the end of the presentation. Um, today, we will start part two of our series and our presenter is Angela Roach Robinson. Um, Angela is, the, oops, excuse me. Angela is the pastor of Congregational United Church of Christ in High Point. She's a graduate of East Carolina University, Hood Theological Seminary, and Duke Divinity School. She served as a Duke Divinity Guide and Duke University Marshal. She's also a social worker here in the city of High Point. She's a historian. She's a researcher, and I am so pleased to introduce to everyone this morning, Angela Roach Robinson. Uh, thank you all for um, joining in with us on our uh, four-part series. Um, I would want to start with uh, how I started um, doing genealogy and um, it's been a long journey and it continues. Actually, I, I don't think it ever stops because you're always trying to figure out how far back you can go. Today, uh, though, you know, there are many ways to present genealogical information. Uh, but today we're looking at color and wealth. And I've decided to use three couples who are in my family uh, to talk about color and wealth. And when we talk about color and wealth, what we are talking about is uh, status and we're talking about uh, assets. So I wanna start with, um, and as the title says, it's a snapshot. So uh, I like to say you can't tell it all, but we'll give a snapshot today. Uh, I'm utilizing three couples. I'm utilizing uh, Roland Mills and Caroline Brooks. Um, Augustus Roach and Mary Green, and John Bryant Parker, and uh, Elizabeth, who the family calls Betty Wilson. Um, color indicates class, wealth indicates assets. Uh, and today we're going to look at the interlocking systems of racism and capitalism in the United States. When we talk about Roland Mills um, and Caroline Brooks, to talk about color, one must look at that Roland Mills was a free person of color. So what, what does that mean? And how would one become a free person of color? How would one be a free person of color in the period of slavery? Because Roland was born in 1828. Let me see if I can do a share screen here. All right. So, um, and before I get to that, we just look at this first screen. What we see is my great grandmother. This is Esther Mills. Esther Mills is the uh, gr great granddaughter of Roland Mills. So Esther Mills' is uh, father was Louis Bryant Mills. Um, and um, his father was Nasby Mills. And Nasby's father was Roland. So this is my great grandmother. Esther Mills, who graces the event flyer. Uh, to go down to the next slide, uh, we're talking about Mills and Brooks, Roach and Green, Parker and Wilson. And I'll share more about these people and these things. You'll see these pictures as I go through the presentation. So we are now, we're at Roland Mills 
and Caroline Brooks. Roland was born in 1828, uh, Caroline about 1830. And what we have is we have a free man of color in relationship with an enslaved woman. Now, Roland is a free person of color and we know that because he is in the 1860 census. If you were uh, a black person prior to 1870, then you are not in the census by name. So by Roland Mills being in the census by name, we know that he's a free person of color. And the census, I think that's going to be my next slide, yes. So let's look at the census uh, data. Uh, so census data is certainly one way to trace your ancestor. But it's not just about finding a name on a document. It is about exploring all the elements of that document to understand that person's, to get an understanding. It will get shed light on that person's situation at the time. So this is um, a page from the 1860 census. I'm just gonna go down to where Roland's name is. So what we have is Roland Mills um, and you will see, uh, his age, he's 32, M, that first M stands for male, that second M. Uh, let me go back up so that you really, uh-oh, so that you can see this. So right uh, here in this line, I think uh, right here, it says color. And you have three options. You have the option of white, you have the option of black, and you have the option of what? at that time was called mulatto. And mulatto simply means a mixed race person. And so when we look at this census data for Roland, we see that he is mulatto. We see that he's a day laborer, which uh, means that he's a person that does odd jobs. So he is a mixed race person. Now, one of the questions is how do you be, how would a person be mixed race? Well, some, black and mixed race people uh, were free because they purchased their freedom. Um, they scrapped and saved and worked and begged and borrowed and they purchased their freedom. But Roland was a free person of color as a minor, which means he did not purchase his freedom. Another way that a person uh, could be a free person of color is because they were manument, uh, manumented. That is an enslaver purchased their freedom, but they went through a legal process, which means at the end of the process, you have a document in hand that says that you are free. But Roland was free, not by manumission, because manumission usually, typically, in the main was because the person had rendered notorious service. They had provided uh, great service to an enslaver and that the enslaver was grateful for this and um, they may have pro provided service or protected uh, a master or a master's family. And so by their notorious service, then they are freed by the enslaver. But Roland was a free person of color as a minor. He did not commit acts of notorious service in order to become free. So another way that you're, you're free is that you are born free. Now, this is why uh, I think that Roland may possibly be a person, a free person of color because his mother is a white meals woman and his father is an enslaved African. That's, that's what my research leads me to think. Now, um, Roland uh, may possibly have a free white mother and that person would be a Mills. And if I look at the, when we look at the census data, it is the case that there are three free persons of color in the, 
schedule of a man named, of a white man named Samuel Mills. And we know when we look at these three free persons of color, when we look at their lives, when we go forward and look at their lives, these three persons of color show up in various places attached to various people. I won't get into all of that in this session, but they grow up and become attached to various persons and live in various places in Pitt County. So, and it is also interesting to note that there is an, uh, uh, um, an enslaved man also in the household of uh, Samuel Mills in 1840, who would be of an age that that person could possibly be the father of Roland Mills. These are possibilities. And the reason I bring this up is because, uh, one of the reasons I bring this up is because most people, when you talk about that a person was of mixed race during the era of slavery, their minds automatically go to a scenario of a white enslaver who takes advantage of a black enslaved woman. And what Roland and Caroline Brooks does for us is to help us think through other options. Because one, Roland is a mixed race person who is free. But Caroline is a mixed race person who is enslaved. So they're both mixed race, but one is free, one is enslaved. Now, uh, so I don't know Roland's parents by name, uh, but his color indicates his status. I don't know Caroline Brooks's uh, biological parents by name, but her status is, is indicated by the fact that she is not named in the census. Roland and Caroline were not legally married. They were not legally married because it was illegal for a free person of color to be in relationship with an enslaved person because an enslaved person does not own themselves. They are owned by someone else. So they are not free to marry. So Roland and Caroline, Mill, uh, Caroline Brooks were not legally married because marriage was proscribed to them. But, but they had children together. They were in an illegal relationship, but they were in a relationship and they had children together. Their first child was Nasby. So let's go down. Uh, as I share my screen to the next slide. This is Nasby. Nasby born about 1847, lived to about 1919. He's Roland and Caroline's uh, first child. So Nasby is Esther Mills's grandfather. Remember, Esther is the woman who graces the event flyer. This is Esther's grandfather. Nasby was born into slavery. He was born into slavery because his mother, was an enslaved mixed race woman. Um, because Roland and Caroline were prohibited from marriage, Roland is on the 1860 census as a single man because the census can, there are things the census taker cannot enumerate. He can't, Roland is in relationship with Caroline and they have children together. They have all their children by 1860. All their children are born by 1860, but the census taker cannot enumerate that because Roland and Caroline are in an illegal relationship and Caroline's children don't belong to Roland. Caroline's children belong to Frederick, I'm sorry, yeah, to um, Francis Brooks, to Francis Brooks. So when you read the census, you also need other things to look at in order to understand the family dynamics. Um, the census taker isn't able to capture that Roland is in a relationship, 
but we would be wrong to take the census for face value. Uh, we have to do further research because the family knows that uh, Roland and Caroline are in relationship. Roland lived at one end of the road. Caroline lived at the other end of the road. Roland uh, lived in uh, a house at the end of Jack Jones Road and that road was in the district of Coxville, named after a prominent white family with the surname of Cox. But Caroline lived on the same road, but at the other end of the road. And at the end of the road, Jack Jones Road in Pitt County in what today we know as Winterville, but in 1860, it wasn't Winterville. In 1860, at the end of Jack Jones Road where Caroline lived, that was the Greenville District. Today, Jack Jones Road is a lonely road. But when Caroline and Roland lived on Jack Jones Road, there was a whole lot going on. Two years ago, I undertook the tedious task of reading through Pitt County court records. What makes these records so arduous is that they are handwritten documents which have not been alphabetized. Uh, I was floored when I found an 1867 record of a man named Thomas Cox, who he is the, his family, the Coxville is named after his family. His name is Thomas Cox and he goes into court and he asked to be the administrator of Roland Mills $300 estate. He asked for two other white persons to be executors, JJ Perkins and BC Pierce are appointed the executors for Roland's estate. Now, this is 1867. And in 1867, none of Roland's children are of legal age to be administrators or executors of his, his estate. Today, you are a legal adult if you're 18. When you turn 18 today, you are a legal adult. You can sign contracts. You know, you can sign documents, you, you, can, you can be legally responsible. But in this period, one had to be 21 in order to be legally responsible. Ro, Ro, none of Roland's children. So NASB is not of legal age to be the executor or the administrator of Roland's estate. NASB in the 1870 census is serving as the head of household for uh, the majority, not all, but the majority of his siblings. Nasby, my mixed race great great grandfather was born into slavery. A man who was a founding member of the Pitt County Ku Klux Klan was court appointed executor of Nasby's father's estate. So much terror, anguish, and loss was attached to the names uh, of his father, of Nasby's father, Roland, and his mother, Caroline, that when Nasby married in 1871, the record is blank for his parents. Yet Nasby Mills left a 1919 last will and testament in which he gave 40 plus acres of land to his children. And this is the family of Nasby Mills who married Harriet Kilpatrick. And I'll just pause to say here that uh, East Carolina University is um, researching and um, preserving a uh, cemetery in East in uh, Pitt County, and we have relatives in that cemetery. This is Nasby's will. 
Now we're gonna move our attention to Augustus Roach and Mary Green. This is a picture of JJ Tucker uh, and his wife, uh, Susan. Susan is the half sister of John Richard Roach. John Richard Roach was the enslaver of Augustus Roach. So this couple intersects with my family in several ways. Um, so they intersect with my family in that Susan is the half sister of Augustus's enslaver. So that's on the Roach side. But on the Hardy side, which I'm not presenting the Hardys today, but this is a way, another way that this couple intersects with my family. J.J. Tucker and his wife uh, sold uh, land to uh, Philippi Missionary Baptist Church in the village of Simpson. Uh, and this is the couple who sold them that land. Now, Augustus Roach and Mary Green, they have a different status. They are enslaved persons, very different from Roland uh, Mills, who was a free person of color. Uh, but let me pause and say this. I always ask how free is free? When you're talking about black people being free, the question needs to be asked, how free is free? And, and I ask that question because Roland is a free person of color in a relationship that is proscribed by law and his family, he's not able to live with his family. How free is free? When he dies, three men who, who are not family are the executors and administrators of his estate. How free is free? Augustus and Mary are enslaved persons. Um, you can find their names on the cohabitation record. So after the Civil War, the Southern states passed laws whereby formerly enslaved persons can now register their marriage. And how that worked is you pay 25 cent to the justice of the peace who then entered your name with the clerk of court to say, yes, these folks uh, married. So Augustus Roach and Mary Green married, the record says, March the 1st, 1851. Now, the thing I want to note about uh, Augustus is that he served in the um, Civil War uh, in the U.S. Colored, U.S. Colored Troops. So U.S.C.T., U.S. Colored Troops, the 37th um, regiment. Now, um, as I forestated, John Richard Roach was the enslaver of Augustus. John Richard Roach was the biological child of Samuel and Sarah Chapman Roach. If, um, if Pitt County folks are a part of this, or I know that some Craven County folks were interested in this presentation, this Sarah Chapman is from the huge slaveholding Chapman family of Craven County. So John Richard Roach was the son, biological son of Samuel and Sarah Chapman Roach. So Sarah Chapman married a man named Samuel Roach uh, and Sarah uh, later married John Galloway uh, when John Richard was a minor. John Richard was born about 1838. Augustus was born about 1840. John Richard never married. Augustus married Mary Green in 1858. Um, North Carolina succeeded from the Union May 20, 1861. North Carolina was the second to the last state to join the Confederacy. John Richard Roach joined the Confederacy in 1862. He rose to the rank of captain. Augustus Roach joined the Union February 8, 1864. He sustained injury while digging out trenches and building defenses in the state of Virginia. John Richard Roach was shot on the right side of his head in 1874 in Virginia. So the enslaver and the enslaved were both fighting 
in the Civil War, one for the Confederacy, one for the Union, both sustained injury. Augustus received a uh, certificate of uh, medical discharge, but John Richard Roach died in Delaware in 1865. His family brought his body back to Pitt County and he's buried in the family cemetery. I think I have, um, so one of the things to note here is that because he sustained a medical discharge, he received a pension for life. At the time, the pension was about $8 per month. So with that $8, uh, Augustus Roach had his 25 cents to go to the justice of the peace and to declare his marriage. This is his certificate of discharge. Now we are moving to the John Bryant Parker and Elizabeth Wilson family. So what you have here, uh, it might be hard to read. So let me point out some things. So this is the death certificate of Joe Wilson. Joe Wilson is Betty Wilson's brother. So my great grandmother, one of my great grandmother's brothers was Joe Wilson. Joe had a son named David. David is the informant for Joe's death in 1946. Uh, David, the informant says that Virgil Wilson, so Virgil Wilson is Joe Wilson's father. So Virgil Wilson is my great grandmother's father. David says that Virgil was born in Africa. Now, the way I like to um, help us to think through this document is that the United States outlawed the international slave trade in 1808 because let's just pause and think about that for a minute. The slave trade was legal. <laughs> the slave trade was a legal uh, industry. But in 1808, the United States outlawed the international, the transatlantic slave trade. My documents, there are documents that tell me that Virgil was born about 1828 the same year that Roland Mills was born. Now, so if it's the case, if David is right, if he's put the correct information, if Virgil was born in 1828, then Virgil was caught up in the illegal international slave trade, somehow smuggled in to the United States. That's a story in and of itself. Now, but let's say that David is wrong, that Virgil wasn't actually born in Africa. Even if David is wrong, if he's incorrect by saying that Virgil was born in Africa, the, the takeaway is that even as late as 19, 1946, my Wilson family has a story and a memory of Africa that has been retained. That's pretty powerful. That David, the grandson of Virgil, has memories that have been shared with him from his grandfather or his father about his people in Africa. This man is John Bryant Parker. And John Bryant Parker, our family refers to him as Papa. Papa was born in 1876 and he died in 1954. John Bryant Parker died one day after the Supreme Court ruled that separate was not equal. It, it, it 
John Bryant Parker died one day after the Brown versus Board of Education decision. John Bryant Parker was born after slavery. He's born in 1876. So this is the reconstruction period. And he dies in 1954, right at the beginning of the modern civil rights movement. John Bryant Parker purchased two lots of land in what we now know as the village of Simpson. He purchased his first two lots in 1914. 1914? purchased his first two lots during World War I. He purchased another nine lots in 1918. This is the marriage certificate of John Bryant Parker and Betty Wilson. Now remember I said, when you're looking for your ancestors, you're not just looking for their names on documents. When you find their name on the document, it is important to look at the whole document. Yes, be overjoyed that you found them on a document, but scrutinize the document. The reason I'm lifting this up is because when I scrutinize this document, I see a couple of things. One, John Bryant Parker and uh, Betty Wilson got married at the church. That would be Philippi Missionary Baptist Church in the village of Simpson. That would be the church that J.J. Tucker and Susan Galloway, they sold the land to, this, to, the, to the church. Uh, and, and, uh, John Bryant Parker and Elizabeth Wilson got married at the church because the reason I'm bringing this up they must have really been somebody's because a lot of people got married before the justice of the peace. A lot of other people got married by the minister in the home of the minister or in the home of the bride or in the home of the groom. As we know today, not every minister is a pastor. Every pastor is a minister, but not every minister is a pastor. John Bryant Parker and Elizabeth Wilson were married in the church by their pastor. That's big time in 1904. This is the deed for the first two land purchases of John Bryant Parker. This is the incorporation papers for the village of Simpson. Simpson is my paternal family's home. It's where John Bryant Parker purchased all his land. And you will note, well, let me just say for you that when the white citizens uh, of the community wanted to incorporate Simpson, what they did was they went to all what, the, what is called freeholders in the document. Freeholders simply means landowners. Well, John Bryant Parker was a landowner. That's why his name is in this document because they went to all the land, black landowners to ask about incorporating this community um, in 19, I believe that was in 1921, I believe. This is John Bryant Parker and his family. So. You begin with John Bryant Parker on your left. Uh, that's Betty Parker and all of their children. My grandmother was Cassie Ring Parker and she is the next to the last child in this picture. How do I know that she's the next to the last child? Because you see, my grandmother was a fraternal twin. So twins, Cora, and Cassie. How do I know which one is Cassie and which one is Cora? Because I have a certificate uh, that tells me uh, that Cora was born first and Cassie was born second. So they line their children up in uh, birth order. So my grandma Cassie is the next to the last child 
in this picture. This is the 1930 census record for John Bryant Parker. In 1930, his house was valued as, at $1,000. Um, of the black people in the village of Simpson, there were only two other uh, homes that were valued at $1,000. And the $1,000 is the highest value of any black home in the village of Simpson in 1930. So he was one of three families that had a home value of $1,000. This is John Bryant and Betty Parker's house, uh, a picture, pictures that I took in 2019. That, in other words, that home is still standing. So I'll bring this to a close. So some of the resources that I have used that you can use to research your family, of course, talk with your family. Uh, there's a free site called Family Search. Um, of course, there's Ancestry. And then I did do my Ancestry DNA. Uh, cohabitation records, wills, deeds, obituaries, find a grave, slave schedules, census records, the National Archives, access to archive of databases. I'll just uh, briefly say about that is when I use that resource, that's when uh, it corroborated a story in my family about my paternal grandfather. That is, there was a story about a child that had died and I was able to corroborate that story through the National Archives access to archival databases. Death certificates, marriage certificates, birth certificates, military records, maps. Maps are, if you're not using maps, you need to start using maps because maps help to put things in proximity, helps you to see where your ancestors lived and where they lived in relationship one to another. Military records, maps, family histories from other families. And so I'm, I want to show you a family history that I use. This is um, Mary Nelson Smith. And let me just say, um, that when I began to research, I did it, I started in an unorthodox way because a lot of people tell you that to, to start your research, you, you first start with your oldest family members and that's where you begin. That's not how I began. I'm not saying you can't do it that way and it's a commendable way to do it. I'm just saying that's not how I started. The way I started was I said to myself, my ancestor had the, has the last name of Roach. He didn't bring that name from Africa. I'm gonna find the white roaches and that's where I'm gonna begin. And so this um, uh, genealogy uh, research done by this woman, Mary um, Nelson Smith helped me to do that because in her book, she deals with, she traces the roaches, and the Chapmans. And that was pivotal to helping me to find out more about my ancestor, Augustus Roach. This is this presentation, along with all the other presentations, are a, a partnership with the library as well. I'm here at the museum, but it is also a partnership with the library. And so I want to commend a few books to you because it's important to understand the historical context that your ancestors, ancestors lived in. So I would recommend um, David Walker's Appeal. The reason I recommend this book is because it was written in 1829 and my ancestor, uh, Roland Mills was born in 1828. And if you believe some of the other records, my ancestor, Virgil Wilson was also born in 1828. I commend to you incidents in the life of a slave girl I, commit, I think that every North Carolinian should read this book. Uh, it comes from the perspective of a woman. Uh, this was in Northeastern North Carolina. I also recommend Out of the House of Bondage because this book helps me to understand uh, Caroline Brooks and Mary Green because it's talking about that the immediate period after slavery and how black and white women interacted with one another. 
And then, and lastly, I recommend the book Cast. I recommend this book because it helps you to really understand the interlocking systems of race and capitalism. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angela. That was fantastic. Um, it looks like we, ooh, hold on. It just closed out on me. Um, it looks like we just have a couple of questions. Um, let me see the first one. Uh, Brenda asks, uh, I missed the first part and, uh, oh, hold on. Uh, oh, here we go. Kelly asks, can you please put the book titles in the chat? Um, or is there a handout? Um, would you maybe be able to do that at the end so that people can copy and paste? Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, and then I, uh, let me see. There, there was one and when I closed out, hold on. <laughs> uh, well, let's go ahead. Um, Okay, I'm not seeing it anymore. Um, but yes, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in. Um, and then, yes, if you just wanna say the books one more time, maybe I can uh, just uh, uh, just uh, re uh, type them in real quick. Do you wanna say them one more time, Angela? The books? Yes. yes. All right, so the first book is appeal to the colored citizens of the world. Okay. That's by David Walker. Appeal to the colored citizens of the world. All right. Um, all right, we're good there. And um, then incidents in the life of a slave girl by Harriet Jacobs. Incidents in the life of a slave girl, Harriet Jacobs. All right. And then out of the house of bondage. Say that again. Out of the house oh. of bondage. I'm going to spell her name. Okay. It's T H A V O L I A. Last name G L. Y M P H. Now this is a scholar. Uh, Thavolia is a scholar from Duke University. And the last book that I commend to you is Cast mm -hmm. by Isabel Wilkerson. Great. And we do have humor questions now. Um, let's see. Have your ancestry DNA results helped clarify your relationship? to the Mills and Brooks yet, particularly the mother of the free man of color. And this was from Larry. So um, what, I, what, what my ancestor DNA did was verify that I am related to the Brookses. So um, I, I won't name names, but a name that I am very familiar with on the Brooks side um, came up in my uh, DNA. Um, and Kelly asked, have you been successfully using probate records in your research and how did they help you? Any tips on how to best use them? Well, um, so one of the things I'm going to recommend is um, look at the, what is it, session of court and pleas, I think it's called, because that's how I found that Roland had a, a $300 estate in 1867. So I'm not, so I see this record where they go into court and ask to be executors. I, I have not found how that, was, how that indeed was administrated or executed, but yes, the records show that they went into court and asked to be administrators and executors of the estate. Um, yes, but probate records are gonna show you about uh, relationships 
And sometimes you get names in there that you uh, might not otherwise have seen or made a connection to. Uh, you get to see how families are related one to another. Uh, you get to see, you can better identify who's married to who and who lives beside who. So yes, they're essential. Uh, I, I can answer this one. Sane asked if we if we can rewatch the video. Uh, yes, it is being recorded. Um, we will post it on our Facebook, Instagram, uh, and YouTube, uh, probably next Wednesday. Mm -hmm. um, and then G L Moses asked, uh, "Do you have family in the Wake County area?" I think the question is going, you're really kind of asking about um, back in the day, I guess the early period. If I, if I, if so, I don't know it. Um, I thought that there might have been a connection to the Parkers in Wake, uh, but upon further research, uh, I don't think so. So if I do, I don't know it. Uh, and then Kelly asked, were you able to find more information about your connection to Africa? What resources do you use or do you recommend for that? So that is, that's new for me. So mm -hmm. uh, it's a relatively, I think I've had this record for maybe about a year now. So uh, it, within this year, I have um, produced uh, two family histories. And so I, I have not taken the time to try to trace that. I certainly, of course, intend to, but I've not yet. So um, I, I can't really help you with that. Uh, and it looks like our last one, uh, Aisha asked, uh, who do you believe to be Roland Mills's parents? I believe I've connected via DNA uh, to a white Mills family of Pitt County. So, um, so the short answer is, I do not know who Roland's parents are. The short answer is, I do not know who Caroline Brooks's parents are. But what we do know is that Roland Mills is a mixed race person, which means that he has one parent who's white, and one parent who is either, because this, because you, you got to understand this, if you're, he, he could have a white parent and then a mixed race parent, and he's going to be a mixed race person. He could have a white parent and a black parent, and that's going to make him a mixed race person. All right. Uh, I don't know who his parents are. And Caroline Brooks, I don't know who her parents are, but what we do know is that she is of mixed race. And, and, and another thing to say with that is what we know is that Roland is with the Millses and Caroline is with the Brookses. All right, I think, I think that is it. We've got a lot of people telling you thank you. I <laughs> agree with that. <laughs> um, and Phyllis, do you have anything else um I do, I do not but okay. um i i really really enjoyed this presentation i angela and i have had numerous conversations where she shared her family history and her journey of searching and i it's like every time i we talk i learn something from her so um when i finally take the time to start researching uh, my family history. Um, I will be calling on her and, and um, using the resources that she have provided uh, for us today. A couple of the books I do have. So I thoroughly enjoyed the presentation. Angela, thank you so much for sharing with everyone. Um, let's see, was that another question? Uh, it doesn't look like it. Okay. Um, so again, Angela, thank you so much. Um, and that concludes our part two.
four of our four, uh, four part series for today, researching your genealogy. So please join us again next week. We will have part three of this series and our presenter will be Marcellus Joyner. Uh, Marcella is an expert researcher and his presentation will be um, showing us how to use social media to uh, research our uh, family tree, genealogy. So you don't wanna miss that. So please, you can go online and register now. And I hope to see um, and hear from a lot of you next week. And I have uh, put the link in the chat so that you can register for the next two ones ahead of time, so. All right, thank you everyone. Have a thank gorgeous you. weekend.